Good morning, everyone. Won't you stand with us, please? this morning let's uh bring the house lights up look around see if you can find someone that you don't know and introduce yourself and let's greet one another with a handshake Well, 
a seat. Good morning. Good morning. Today is a sad day, but yesterday was a Saturday. Sorry. I love dad jokes. Don't you love dad jokes? Come on. Yeah, those are great. All right. Hey, we're so glad you're here with us today. We, we just welcome you. We thank you for spending part of your weekend with us. You could have gone anywhere else uh, that you that's out there. You could have gone, but you chose to be here, and we're so grateful for that. If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much. We just appreciate it when you come. And as a matter of fact, we would like you to look in the um, seat back in front of you and find our Connect card. If you'd fill that out, uh, drop it in the offering plate by the doors as you leave. Uh, we would have a record of your visit, and we'll contact you and just thank you for visiting. See if you have any questions about our church. We just want to connect with you a little bit. So if you do that, we'd appreciate it. Also on the back side of that card is a prayer request. And uh, we'd just love for you to share with us uh, some, some of your needs, some things going on in your life that we can pray with you about. If you would look in your viewpoint, and we'll just point out a couple things. Awards night is not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, uh, May 17th. There'll be no student uh, that night, there'll be no adult Bible study that night. Everybody will meet in here for that award time. So uh, I believe we'll have supper that night and then come in here at that time. Uh, hopefully by then, hopefully by this Wednesday, we'll have our AC up and going. Uh, it's supposed to get started on it tomorrow. I know if you don't know, our AC's been down in our fellowship hall. And uh, so uh, hopefully that'll take place and looking forward to that. Um, Wednesday night summer schedule, just let you know, uh, on beginning May 24th, we'll continue to have our student Bible study. We'll continue to have adult Bible study all throughout the summer. However, all of our children's ministries, Awanas, and, and things like that will not go on. So uh, just to give our leaders a little bit of a break, but we will continue to do the adult and the student Bible studies. Uh, camp scholarships, if you would like to help students and kids go to camp, we sure would appreciate that. If you want to uh, uh, give toward that, just uh, put the uh, money in an in offering envelope or a check and just indicate on there for uh, kids camp or student camp or just say camps, and then I'll decide what it does, okay? So uh, anyway, so thank you again uh, for coming. Uh, Pastor Keith is not here today. He's in, uh, he's somewhere, he's in uh, <laughs> South Carolina today. He's got a busy schedule. His wife's in Anderson. Is that no? She's in Cedarville. She's in Cedarville, and uh, so uh, they their daughters have graduated this weekend. Both of them on the same day, Saturday. So uh, Cindy and Cassidy went to one, and he and uh, Courtney went to the other. And so they're going to meet up sometime tomorrow, I think. And uh, anyway, uh, and then they'll spend a little bit of time. So today we have. Uh, we have Keith Burnett, Brownell, Keith, uh, Keith, Kevin, starts with a K, <laughs> Kevin Brownell is uh, with us today, um, uh, he's uh, been helping Pastor Keith with our Aspire, as a matter of fact, it goes right along with, uh, he's at uh, Midwestern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's getting his master's in discipleship, so this Aspire goes right along with what he's getting his master's in, so God's using him in a new direction and doing some things in his life. And so he's going to share a message that God's put on his heart. He'll continue with Joshua. And so y'all be praying for that as he begins that. So let's just all pray right now. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, your goodness, your grace, for the opportunity to come and to worship you, the King, and to bow in your presence. And so, Father, uh, as we continue to worship, just help us in all that we do honor you. We lift up. Kevin to you and pray that you would just anoint him today, that you would give him the words to say, and that we would take those to heart and apply those to our life. So, Father, we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, Amen. Won't you stand with us once again?
Father in heaven, as we just contemplate the words of that song, Lord, you gave everything for us. What do we have? We lay down our lives, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, and we are nothing. We're nothing without you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives, in our church. Lord, just help nothing to quench the Holy Spirit inside of us as your word is brought forth to us. I pray that you'll help Kevin as he, as he speaks. Help us to be ready to hear what he has for us and what the Holy Spirit has given him to speak. Thank you for what you're doing now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks. You may be seated. But I'm new at this, so. <laughs> but we did. We had a great dress rehearsal. We had a, a lot of people that showed up, and I appreciate that. It gave me a chance to work out some of the kinks and uh, get ready for this afternoon. Pastor Keith has been talking about, um, basically, what does it mean to be a, a people of God that are on mission? What does it take for us to, to go out into our workplaces, into our communities, into our neighborhoods, and just be people on mission. And so the last couple of weeks, he's been talking mainly in Joshua 9, where we see, um, you know, after the battle with AI, they've kind of settled in in Gilgal, and they uh, are approached by the Gibbonites. And I love these people, these Gibbonites. I mean, they, they, they this is, the deception that they put on. I mean, they get their old sandals out of the closet. You know, they put the old jeans on with the tears in them. They get the old wine skins out that are cracked, and uh, they bake some bread and lay it out in the sun so it dries out and gets all crumbly. And they come over to, to uh, um, Gilgal and approach the Israelites and say, man, we're, we've come a long journey. You know, we, we have traveled long distance, as you can tell. We are just all worn out. And uh, we just wanted to introduce ourselves to you and uh, just uh, maybe talk about a peace treaty because we've been hearing about uh, your uh, adventures in the area and we're a little uh, afraid of what's going on. So we, we wanted to kind of get together and uh, talk a little bit about some uh, a peace agreement. And we realized uh, what we hear from uh, Joshua is that, you know, the Israelites do not counsel God. And they make a peace agreement with uh, the Gibbonites. And then uh, the Israelites, a few days later, decide, hey, let's go. Let's go for, look for a new, new city to conquer. And they travel a few days, and they come upon the Gibbonites. Well, now they realize they've, they uh, have been deceived that uh, their journey was not so long. It was only maybe 20 miles or so. And uh, so they, the Israelite men in the army, they're like, well, let's wipe them out. Let's kill them. But as Pastor Keith talked about last week is that Israelites were people of integrity. And we need to be people of integrity. And what he did is he saw that Joshua said, no, we are not going to kill these people. Because these people are, we made an agreement before God to protect them. And that's what we're going to do. So chapter 10, we kind of get into... Um, what happens after that? So 
that's kind of where I want to start out today. Uh, first of all, I want to just talk a little bit about a gentleman by the name of George Mueller. Um, George Mueller was a, uh, a famous uh, um, individual who started up orphanages in England, and uh, he understood what it meant to be on mission. And uh, the story goes that uh, many years ago, obviously, uh, he was in a situation where their orphanage had pretty much run out of all their food. Uh, they had no food, they had no milk, nothing. Now, for most of us, we would look at that situation and say, well, we got to go down to the street and knock on some doors and see if we can't, you know, beg for some food, beg for some money. We, we kind of take it upon ourselves to try to fix our situation. What's beautiful about this story is what George Mueller does is he gathers all the children together in the middle of the orphanage. And they pray. They just pray to God. And they spend some sweet time in prayer. And it, just as they finish, there's a knock on the door. And it's a baker from town who is bringing a bunch of bread to the orphanage for the kids. And not long after that baker leaves the house and the kids are enjoying some of the bread, there's another knock on the door. Well, God have it that a milkman's cart broke down right in front of the orphanage. Now, you know, that was obviously just an accident. But the milkman comes to the door and says, look, you can drink all the milk you want because by the time I get my cart fixed and move on, the milk's going to be spoiled. So what we see is that Mueller didn't panic. He didn't try to solve the problem himself. He just had him and his kids just go before God. And trust in him. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at how do we, as a people on mission, learn to trust God. Trust him to a point where doubt, second guessing, unbelief leaves. That we know that we can fully trust him. Before we begin, let's uh, just, open, just do a little prayer ourselves. Father, I just ask you today to open our eyes to your truth, to see through the stories in chapter 10 and see what we are to learn from it. Open the, the eyes of our hearts, Father, that our hearts begin to understand what it means to trust in you. Father, this week as we go out in our communities, that we will act differently this week because we've come to understand what it means to truly trust you. Father, we just ask that uh, you watch over Pastor Keith and Cindy and the girls as they travel this week. And uh, Father, we thank you for giving him the opportunity to just spend some sweet time with his family uh, and to see his girls graduate, Father. That's just... Uh, Something that most parents just, it, you know, it touches our hearts to watch our kids uh, enter uh, society and, and finally uh, get off our paychecks. So, Father, we, uh, we thank you for that, and um, let's have a sweet time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, one of the problems is that God wants us to trust him, trust him in everything, all right? Not just some of the things everything. We have a tendency to pick and choose when we ask God into our lives instead of just being open to him being involved in everything. So the problem we have is we constantly feel like we can be self-sufficient, self-reliant. We doubt that uh, God's going to uh, do what we want done. You know, we get to a point where um, we second guess ourselves sometimes because uh, we, we, we're not sure what we should do or, or how we should go or what, what direction we should take. And part of that is that we, we constantly plan. We, we plan, most of you have probably already planned what you're going to do after church today. You know, we've planned what we're going to do this week. We've planned what uh, we're going to do for retirement. We've planned out our dinner routine for the week. We plan everything. And the reason we plan so much is because we want to control what we do. We want to control how we engage with our neighbors. We want to control how we engage with the world. So 
That's one of our, our problems. The second problem is that we constantly believe that we are self-sufficient. I got this. I don't need any help. I know what I'm doing. I can work my way through this. You know, I might go to God with some prayer here and there, but bottom line, I think I can handle this problem myself. And I know, trust me, you're looking at somebody that does it probably quite often, way too much. But, you know, the whole idea is that we want our prayers to be answered by God the way we want them answered. We forget about his will and how he would answer those prayers. Another problem is that, you know, we, we lack faith in God that, you know, is he going to come through? And if he does come through, is it going to be what I want? So we have a tendency to take away power from God and place our own power on top of our, our needs. The last thing that we have a tendency to do in this area is we have fear. Um, we can't let go. We, we don't know what the outcome is going to be, so sometimes we'd rather not even step in to the situation. We don't want to talk to our neighbor about Christ because he might get offended, so we stay away from it. We don't want to bring God into our work environment because we're worried that people might view us incorrectly or view us in a way that is in, in good light. We, we fear so much. Fear is one of the biggest things that prevent us from becoming who we want. One of the things that I, I believe is, is the, the success of, or the definition of success, something that uh, came across my heart a few years ago, and it's my, my definition of success is that success is when we reach a point of brokenness, that we realize that we cannot move forward without God. That's success, people. That should be our goal in life, to get to a point where we truly trust and do not doubt but that we will allow God to help us go to the next step. That's success. That's what our, our desire is. So, Joshua 10 gives us three concrete certainties that we can look at and focus on uh, to help us become people that are on mission and that trust God. The first one that we're going to talk about is Trust the promises of God. You know, isn't God worthy of our, our trust? I mean, has, has he not shown us numerous times in our lives that he's there and that he comes through in his promises? But yet, no matter how often he does it, we have a tendency not to trust. We, we get to a point where uh, our lens is our desires, not his will. So we look at trust based on our own desires, not God's will. And that's an important point uh, to understand. Uh, let's take a look at uh, chapter 1. We're going to go back to chapter 1 in Joshua, verse 5. Because to me, this is you know one of God's promises that he gives us and he gives Joshua. And Joshua's, uh, at this point, he's getting ready to enter the land of Cana. Uh, they have not yet come across. Um, and God is talking with him, and, and he, God basically tells him, he's like, look, no one will be able to stand against you. As long as you live, I will be with you, just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you, and I will not abandon you. Man, that's a promise, right? But why do we forget it? Because this verse isn't just for Joshua. It's the word of God. It's for all of us, right? To trust and know that God will never abandon us. Let's look, go back to chapter 10. I want to take a look at verse 8. Again, now... Joshua's already been through the battle of Jericho. He's been through the battle of Ai. 
And unfortunately, as we know, that was a, that was a tough one because of sin. They initially were defeated by AI. But they came back and eventually defeated AI. And at this point, um, they're in Gilgal, and uh, God is talking with Joshua once again. And he says, do not be afraid of them, for I have handed them over to you. Not one of them will be able to stand against you. So Joshua's getting ready. The Gibeons have made the uh, peace agreement with Israel, and Joshua is, you know, in the middle of the night, receives a, uh, a messenger from the Gibeons and says, look, we need your help. Um, the five southern kings have come upon us and besieged us, and we need your help. And Joshua gets up, wakes up his 600,000 warriors, and they begin the march to Gibeon. And this isn't a simple march. This is a 3,000-foot climb from where they are in the valley to where Gibeon is. And it's roughly about a 20-mile hike. So in the middle of the night, the Israelites are walking, marching, heading toward Gibeon. And this is what God's saying to him. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. Not a single one of them will be able to stand against you. Once again, a promise from God that's meant for us, that we know he, he follows through on every promise he ever makes. Because in this situation, we, we understand, we know the outcome. You know, that's the advantage we have. We already know the outcome because we got the entire Bible to read. Joshua did not know the outcome, nor did the 600,000 people, he, the warriors that were behind him. They did not know what the outcome was going to be. But they were trusting in God that he was going to be there and he was going to stand with them. Let's take a look at verse 10, or I mean chapter 10, verse 19. This is kind of, we're in the battle already. And we have to understand that when we look at Joshua, there's really three sections in the, in the uh, chapter. These three sections kind of look at them as three picture frames. Each one of them, what's going on them is going on at the same time. This is a single campaign, a single battle on a single day. This is not different time frames and different battles are starting. This is all one battle. And at this point, they've, they've initially met up with the uh, southern kingdoms, and they've started to defeat them. And God is basically saying to the rest of them, go. He says, but the rest of you, don't stay there. Pursue your enemies and attack them from behind. Don't let them enter their cities, for the Lord your God has handed them over to you. Again, another promise from God. And then again, in 1025, Joshua said to them, do not be afraid or discouraged. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord will do this to all the enemies you fight. So we see constantly the promises of God coming through. I remember uh, a point in my life when I was going through some difficult times. Uh, Bonnie and I had moved to... Uh, Florida in 2001. I had my own consulting business, a uh, computer consulting business. I had been in the computer industry for close to 30 years. And um, I know you're thinking I'm not that old. I, I, you know. But I had been in the computer industry for about 30 years and uh, had my own business in Chicago. And we decided, you know, we wanted to move to Florida. My parents lived here. We wanted the grandkids to grow up around their grandparents. And we, so we decided to move down here. And I was going to kind of go back and forth for a little while as I built the business up here in, in uh, Florida uh, and then eventually probably either close down or, or, or lessen my travel to Chicago. Well, we moved in in July of 2001. Two weeks later, 9-11 hit. Within two months, I had no income. I, I had nothing. The, the business dried up, all the contracts dried up, and I was kind of like, hmm, what are we going to do? And that was the, the start of a 12-year trip, uh, or really almost, I don't know, you, 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 it, was, it was a dark, long tunnel that we went through. And we had several times where we were financially, we, we were struggling. 
we were really struggling. And I remember one specific year, it was Christmas time, and we were trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to buy gifts for the kids? You know, we, we just probably had a couple hundred dollars in the checking account at, at most, and um, just really were like, what are we going to do? And Bonnie had gone out to the mailbox, and she comes in, and, and she's got this letter uh, from her aunt in Chicago. And she opens it up, and inside that letter was a $1,200 check. And we were like, what, 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 what is that? You know. So she starts to read the letter, and her aunt basically says, look, every year uh, we try to give back to people um, that are you know, going through some tough times. And we decide God put on our hearts to send you a check this year. Now, we hadn't had long conversations about our financial position with them, but for some reason they understood and they knew. And that check gave us the ability to provide not only for Christmas, but for our family for a couple of months. And it was a, one of the first times in my life that uh, I started to put two and two together, that I could trust God to take care of us in a difficult situation. And at, at this point, you know, I was a Christian. I had been a Christian for about 16 years. I became a Christian in 91 after going through a divorce before I was a Christian, after going through the death of a brother who had a 10-week-old son, moving and starting a business all within six weeks or six months. So four of the top stress factors in life. I hadn't gotten to a point in my life where I trusted God. I hadn't gotten to a point in my life where I understood the promises of God. I went to church every week. I was involved in Bible studies, but from Sunday afternoon, that Bible hit the table at the house, and I never touched it during the week. I wasn't fully aware that what the Bible had and the, and the things that I could learn from it. So... I had to start to learn and see that God had made promises and that I could start to trust those promises in my life. The second point we run into is we have to learn to trust the presence of God. Now, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We know that. But we got to tune into it. We got to listen to it. We got to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit just like we have to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ and our Father God. We have to have a relationship. The Holy Spirit is not just something we have and it just sits there. It's something we have to engage with. He's a, an entity, a person just like God and Christ. He's a spirit, but he's part of us. He's in us. He's given to us. He's one of the promises that God gives us, that we will have the Holy Spirit. We have to understand that God has the ability to show his presence to us all the time. We just have to learn to trust. We have to have faith that God is there. We have to have faith in the Holy Spirit. We have to look at our lives and that see what God is doing every single day in our lives. This is how we can see the presence of God in our lives. If we look at Joshua 1.9 we will start to see how God presented himself and, and his presence was with the Israelites. He says, haven't I commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. This is Joshua 1.9. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So if we go back one, that's a promise of his presence. So we can rely that God is with us all the time. Verse 10, 10. The Israelites have come up upon the, the five kingdoms in battle with um, Gibeon. And he says, the Lord threw them into a confusion before Israel. He defeated them in a great slaughter. That word he, that's not Joshua. That's God. God defeated them in a great slaughter. He chased them through the ascent of Bethron. He struck them down as far as Akeza and Medekai. So the Israelites 
are in this battle, and, and trust me, I'm not trying to paint a picture that Israel is just standing there and God's doing all the work. But God is with them, not just in spirit. He's physically fighting for them. He is taking care of business with the Israelites. He is there. He is part of this battle. He sees the, they see the presence of God in this battle. It's an amazing, I would love to see that every day. You know, we walk out in the world and God's just moving cars out of our way. We drive down the road, thank you, Lord. Just, you know, making things happen. But it's just incredible that when we really look for and understand the presence of God, we start to see it. In verse 1042, again, we see God promising. Joshua captured all the kings and all their lands in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. He was present in this battle. He was there constantly. He made his presence known. It often takes, Tony Evans says, it often takes the darkness of a storm to show the light and presence of God. It kind of reminded me this week as I was preparing for this is what storms have I seen God show up, his presence show up? And I uh, run a business doing bathroom remodeling and construction. And I had landed a job one year. Uh, a gentleman asked me to build out one of these spin cycles. Uh, places where you go and exercise by riding in a bike that doesn't move. I don't understand it, don't want to do it. But they asked me to build this place out. And, you know, the guy seemed to be kind of nice, and we, we made an agreement. I told him, you know, here's what we're talking about. We signed a contract, and I started the job. And this guy proceeded to show up every single day and berate me. Tell me I'm doing things wrong. Tell me uh, why aren't you further along. Uh, just a, a nasty, nasty work environment. He would come in and he'd put his music on. And he was into rap, which was cool. But it was all that cop killing rap and, and, and stuff like that. Which, you know, here I am, a Christian. And I'm having to listen to this stuff all day long. And he's just telling me what I'm not doing right. I got to a point where it's like, look, if you, don't, if you know so much, why don't you do this yourself? And he just kind of backed off a little bit. But it was basically about a three-and-a-half-month situation that I just felt the pull of evilness on my heart. I felt like I was in a place I shouldn't be, that it was just wrong. And I finished the job, and I... His son was there, and we went through everything, and he says, great, I'll, I'll have my dad call you. He'll probably you know, send you a check for the final balance. He owed me about $7,000, and I was just happy to be done. And the phone rang that afternoon, and, and he says, hey, um, everything looks good, but I've got some other things I need done. And I said, okay, no problem. You know, just uh, do me a favor, write me a check, and uh, I'll be happy to do these other things, which I really wasn't planning on it because I didn't really want to be back in there. But he says, look, I'm not going to pay you, not until you do these other things. And man, I was just, I spent that whole week going back and forth with him on the phone. I felt like, you know, man, this, this evilness is just there. And I just, for the first time, I went to God and I said, okay, what would you have me do? Do I walk away from this? What do I do? I wasn't in a financial situation to really walk away from $7,000, but I was also not in a situation where I wanted to put myself in that environment again. And I just said, look, Father, this is up to you. You do what you will have. Just tell me what to do. So I went back. God just said, look, do what you should do as a Christian and fill, finish the job. So I went back and I finished it. And that was one of the first times I felt, because when I went back those next few days, it was different. I, I, I felt the presence of God with me and not the presence of evil that was there. It was one of the first times I started to really realize that 
if we trust in the presence of God, he's going to show up. He's going to be there. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. The third concrete certainty that we learn from Joshua 10 is that we have to trust in the power of God. We have to trust in the power of God. He has the ability to create it. He created everything. He created, and with just a few words, created the entire universe over a few days. That's some serious power. Israel had the opportunity to see the power of God on a fairly regular basis. When they were going through the desert for 40 years, every day they would see the, po- the cl- a pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire at night. They saw the presence and they saw the power of God on a daily basis. But we don't have that opportunity anymore. We have to look. We have to search for the power of God. We have to see it in our own lives. How is he present and how is his power affecting our lives? Let's take a look at Joshua, um, verse 10, 11. Now, at this point, Israel is, uh, you know, battling with the Gibeonites, or not the Gibeonites, the uh, Amorites, and uh, they are running. They're heading back to their, their villages, to their, to their areas in the, in the kingdom. And this is where we pick up. He says, as they fled before Israel, the Lord threw large hailstones on them from the sky along the descent of Beth Rome, all the way to Akaza, and they died. More of them died from the hail than from the Israelite sword. Talk about power. God showed up, fulfilled his promise, showed his presence, and then showed his power by bringing hailstones down and killing these people. Now, these must have been some pretty good-sized hailstones. And it's just amazing how when we trust how God will use his power, his capability, how he will fight for us when we're not capable of doing it on our own. Let's take a look also at verse 10. 12 through 13. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joseph spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel. Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon over the valley of Azar. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on its enemies. Isn't it written in the book of Joshua? So the sun stopped in the middle of the sky. And delayed its setting almost a full day. So what we see here is two, well, actually quite a few things. One, God knows that this battle isn't something that's going to be won in a standard day. That there's more to be done. But he also wanted Israel to do this in one massive campaign. Take care of everything in one day. Now, we know that they're battling, but they end up going all the way to the cities and wiping out the cities completely, destroying them. No one left. The kings, the, the, everyone that lived there. And we see the power of God. Now, there's commentaries out there that you can read that talks about, well, this may not be a literal interpretation. This may be poetry. Well, there's nowhere else in Joshua is it really considered poetry. From being a Christian that believes and trusts that the word of God is the word of God, it's breathed by God, I believe that this is a literal situation. If God has the ability to create the universe, he's got the ability to either stop the earth from moving or at least allow the sun and the moon to stand still for a day. So we got a situation here where we see the power of God take a single 24-hour day and basically turn it into a single 48-hour day to give Joshua, the Israelites, and himself the ability to take on the enemies of of Canaan. If that's not the power of God, man, I don't know know what it is. To to stop the sun in the mid-sky, that is the power of God. It reminds me of a situation that I've been down to Uganda several times in my life, uh, about seven or eight times on mission trips. Um, 
And we had one particular trip that we were going on, and we had a, a project in mind that was uh, an orphanage. And the building that they uh, had was U-shaped. and It had this huge courtyard. And Uganda, there's a lot of rain during the rainy season. So the kids had nowhere to go. The, the U-shaped building was basically their rooms that they, they lived in and stayed in and the, and the kitchen and stuff like that. So when it rained, they really didn't have anything to do but sit in their rooms. So they wanted to have the ability to put a roof over this courtyard so that the kids could still be outside during the rain. Well, I had gone down a week before because I knew it was going to take a little bit of time to pull materials together. Unfortunately, Home Depot and Lowe's are not in Uganda. So it was a process. You know, you go to the lumber yard, and you tell them what you need, and they're going to pull all that lumber together for you. Now, they don't own trucks. They don't have, so you, now you have to walk down the street, and you have to go and negotiate with the truck driver and get the truck driver to come over and pick up your lumber. And he pulls the, the truck into the lumber yard. Now you have to negotiate with some of the people in the lumber yard to load the truck for you. So it's a constant process. So we get the truck loaded up. We're heading out, and the, the truck driver says, well, you know, we got to stop and get gas. So we stop at a gas station, and this guy walks up to the window, and he says, hey, you, you got a lot of lumber back there. I said, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of lumber back there. we got a big project. He's like, do you need help? And I hadn't even really thought about it. We're, we got all this lumber, and we're heading an hour and a half away to this orphanage, which has a bunch of little kids, mostly, and I hadn't thought about how we can unload this. So I said, yeah, you want to help us? He's like, yeah. So he jumps right on the truck. I found that amazing because he didn't ask me where we are going. He didn't ask me, how much are you going to pay me? You know, we'd have that all written out and signed and stamped before we got on that truck. In Uganda, there's, there's no unemployment, there's no Social Security, there's no health care, there's nothing. You have to get up every single day and trust that God's going to provide you with the ability to take care of your family. The average Ugandan lives on about $3 a day. That's, that's a, a living in Uganda. So we get on the truck, we drive an hour and a half away, we back up, we get out of the truck, he immediately looks around, sees about four kids, 16, 15, 16 years old, boom, 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 let's go. They don't ask him, how much are you paying me? They just unload the truck. Now, I'm figuring myself and the guys that are with would have taken probably two or three hours to unload this truck. These guys, in about 30 minutes, they got it unloaded and stacked, according to size, organized, everything. I'm just like, whew, unreal. So he comes over to me, and he says, hey, uh, we're done. And I said, okay. And he's like, can you pay me? And I said, sure, sure. Wait, you know, how much do you need? And he says, uh, 5,000 shillings, which is about... A dollar twenty-five to a dollar thirty, depending on the exchange rate. And I'm just like, okay. I said, well, you got some guys that you hired here to help you unload. I said, let me give you a little lecture for them. And you worked really hard, so let me give you a little lecture. And I gave him five hundred thousand shillings, not five thousand. It was a, for us. It was about one hundred twenty-five, one hundred thirty bucks. You know, and we, we got a probably a $10,000 budget for the week uh, for our trip. So, you know, I wanted to treat him right. Well, this guy doesn't just drop to his knees. He falls prostrate on the floor. He's just crying. He's just like, holy cow. His, his life got changed a little bit that day, and it wasn't because of me. It was because he trusted in the promises of God. He trusted in the presence of God. He trusted in the power of God. He didn't care where he was going. He didn't worry about what he was going to get paid because he knew in his heart, God's going to take care of me because he knows I need to be able to provide for my family. It just broke me down, man. 
I, I experienced so many things in Uganda uh, over the years. You know, they, they say that we're going to these countries to bless the people there. What we don't realize is it's not them that's getting blessed, it's us. If you haven't been on a mission trip yet, get on one. Because to experience the blessings of being around people that trust in God and believe in God and live their lives every day knowing that God will provide. I mean, Uganda is a country where most people have nothing. And I've never met so many people that are happy and content. And then I come home to a country where we have everything. And we, we're unhappy. We're discontent. And unfortunately, it's because we, we don't trust. We don't trust in the promises. We don't trust in the presence. And we certainly don't trust and expect the power of God to come every single day and take care of us. See, we have to get to a point in our lives where God is priority. That every decision we make goes through Christ. We can't go through life making our own decisions all the time, fighting our own battles all the time. Because what will happen is we'll become discouraged, worn out, and just a weak Christian. Our strength as Christians is to be in the word of God. And that's what we need to do. How do we come to the point where we can trust God 100% and allow doubt and second-guessing go away? The number one thing is prayer. Now, I'm not talking about praying the wish list, praying for the things that we want versus the things that we need. I'm talking about praying for wisdom, praying for discernment, praying for understanding, praying for God to be in our lives in a way that we're not used to. Pray that we know God better. We need to pray that our lives can be altered and changed by God. Joshua 1.8 It shows to us the second thing that we must do, and that is to pour over the Word of God. When you go home today, put this Bible somewhere that it's going to be in your way. Don't put it on your nightstand. Don't put it on your coffee table. Put it on the dining room table. Put it where you're going to see it, and you're going to be forced to pick it up and go to it. Joshua 1.8. This book of instructions must not depart your mouth. Your mouth. Not your heart, not your mind, your mouth. What does that mean? You've got to know it. If you're going to speak it, you've got to know it. You've got to read it. You can't just hear it from time to time and commit it to your heart. You have to read it. That's what this is saying. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may Carefully observe everything written in it. Then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Folks, the word of God is how our lives are winning lives. It's how we reach people is by having the word of God in our hearts. It's how we live on mission as a church, by knowing the word of God. It has to be something that we commit ourselves to every single day, not just on Sunday. The Word of God is extensive. We could spend the rest of our lives studying this. We'll never understand everything in it. But if you're not doing it every single day, you're just falling farther and farther and farther and farther and farther and farther and farther behind. God wants us to understand His Word because this is where we see the promises. This is where we see the presence this is where we see the power of God. It's not just coming in here and listening to guys like me and Keith praying, preaching. It's about spending time with God in his word and absorbing it and understanding it and putting it to practice in our lives. The last thing, praise God. Praise God for everything in your lives. 
Because the reality is, without God, we'd have nothing. We have to praise him when he comes through. We have to praise him every single minute of every single day. Whether he has answered a prayer in a way that we wanted, or he's answered a prayer based on his will. Sometimes answered prayer takes years. Look at Abraham. The promises made to him took generations. We can't always expect God to answer our prayer immediately and in the way that we want him to. We have to be willing to trust in him, in his promises, his presence, and his power. That over time, he will fulfill our prayers based on his will, not ours. That's the key is understanding that he will answer our prayers based on his will. Father, let's just close in prayer. Lord, I ask that this week, as we go out into the community, that you would give us a new understanding of trust in you, that we would do things we normally wouldn't do because we trust in you, that we would reach out to our neighbors, reach out to people at work, because we trust in you, in your presence and your power. Father, I just pray that this week you would just open new doors, Father, for us to be a church on mission, a church on mission that trusts you in everything in our lives. We need to hand over anything and everything in our hearts to you, Father. We cannot do things on our own. We have to do them through you, with you, and because of you. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us the ability to read the Word of God. Thank thank you for giving us the ability to be here each and every Sunday to praise you. Thank you for just working in our lives when we don't even know you're doing it. We just pray, Father, that uh, you would open our, our eyes of our hearts this week so that we can see you and trust in you and believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just won't you stand with us, please?
It's been great worshiping with you today. God bless you all as you go. We hope to see you back again next week. God bless.